Joining us now on the line from Sherbrooke, Quebec, Dr. Jacques Pépin, who is the author of a new book called The Origins of AIDS. And Dr. Pépin, we're happy to have you on TVO tonight. Comment allez-vous? It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you very much. Well, we have known, of course, about AIDS, I guess conventionally speaking, for 30 years now. But you think it goes back further. How far back do you trace the origins of AIDS? Uh, the current estimation is that the first uh, person who was infected with the virus got it from a, a chimpanzee, and that person probably was infected around 1921. So it's almost uh, 100 years ago. How did the infection take place? Uh, the most likely scenario is that uh, a hunter uh, eventually uh, got a chimpanzee in one of his straps and while cutting out the chimpanzee meat so to be able to bring back pieces of the animal to the village that uh, hunter got hurt he injured himself with, a, with his knife if it was not the hunter then maybe it was the hunter's wife uh, in the village while preparing the meat so that's the most likely scenario because several other uh, hypotheses have been examined and, and can now be rejected firmly so it's the only scenario that <clears throat> that remains plausible now. And which country do you think this took place in? The, uh, the source of HIV-1 is a chimpanzee, a specific subspecies of chimpanzee, which inhabits uh, a limited part of Central Africa. So that includes southern Cameroon, a small part of the Central African Republic, Congo-Brazzaville, Gabon, and Equatorial Guinea. So the the very first person who started the pandemic was certainly, uh, certainly living in one of these countries. And let me take us off the path just for a second here because you said HIV-1, which uh, may be news for some people. You, you have them broken down into HIV-1 and 2. What's the difference? Well, HIV-2 is a virus which uh, uh, remained limited to some parts of West Africa, so uh, about two or three thousand kilometers away from the region where HIV-1 emerged. The source of HIV-2 is a different uh, primate. It's actually a small monkey called the Suti Mangabe, and the uh, the virus uh, is less pathogenic than HIV-1, and it's also uh, less transmissible. So if you look at the whole, uh, the whole, uh, the whole world, about 99% of cases of AIDS are caused by HIV-1, and only 1% at most are caused by HIV-2. Okay, let's get back on the path now, and let's return to Africa and have you tell us how you think colonial Africa's history played into the spread of AIDS. Well, <clears throat> there were two factors that, in my opinion, played a substantial ro role, and they were both related to the colonization of Central Africa. So the first one was the urbanization of that part of the world. The colonial powers created cities in which, uh, for several reasons, uh, there was a, a very substantial excess in the number of adult men compared to the number of adult women. And the consequence of that, which was uh, predictable, was the, the development of urban prostitution. So that facilitated the sexual transmission of HIV-1 in the cities. The other factor, which was at least as important and, and perhaps even more important, was the development of medical interventions uh, for the control of a small number of tropical diseases. So what happened is that the uh, colonizing powers had mobile teams that visited each and every village uh, twice a year. They would try to find out everybody who had uh, a, a given uh, a small number of infectious diseases. And the people who, who were found to, be, uh, to, to have these infectious diseases, they were treated right there in the village with uh, drugs that were administered uh, intravenously. And at the time, the medical doctors were not aware that viruses uh, could be transmitted uh, through syringes and needles. So the uh, sterilization was uh, inadequate. And of course, the syringes and, and needles were constantly, constantly reused on a, you know, on a number of patients uh, every day. 
and there was uh, certainly some transmission of HIV-1 through this uh, mode of transmission, uh, iatrogenic infection. Well, Dr. Pepin, let me actually read an excerpt from your book which follows up on what you just said. You wrote, I do not believe that transmission via medical interventions plays an important role in HIV dynamics today, and I agree with the experts who maintain that it contributes to less than 5% of recent HIV infections, although even a single case is unacceptable. However, I became convinced that transmission during healthcare contributed to the simultaneous emergence of HIV-1 and HIV-2 in different parts of the African continent 50 to 75 years ago. And I gather you conclude that you yourself must have played a personal role in the spread of AIDS. How so? Well, I, I worked in the, in the Congo in the uh, early 1980s for four years. Uh, the country was then known as Zaire. Uh, I worked in a small hospital about 500 kilometers northeast of Kinshasa. And uh, at the time, uh, of course, HIV was not yet known. Uh, but the, uh, the hepatitis B virus was known. What I can say is that at the time, there was no preoccupation among the medical officers or among the uh, nursing personnel. Uh, there was no preoccupation towards the potential transmission of viruses through uh, syringes and needles. Uh, what happened uh, practically was that I, I was supervising a network of about 20 health centers, which were located in small villages. There was no electricity in these villages, and the to sterilize the syringes and needles, because we, we didn't have single-use syringes and needles at the time. To sterilize, they were just put into a small container with a tablet of formal. And the, that, the, the vapor of formal that uh, persisted in the container was uh, certainly enough to kill the bacteria, but I'm not sure that it was good enough to kill the viruses. In, in the hospital itself, uh, usually the sterilization of syringes and needles was pretty good, but there were periods of time when there was no electricity for up to uh, two months at a time. And then we just, uh, the only way we could sterilize the syringes and needles was through the boiling. But at the, at the time, uh, like all other medical officers working in the country, I, I was not preoccupied with the transmission of viruses and I didn't pay attention to how long the, the actual boiling took place. So it's, it's plausible that uh, a few patients under my care uh, were infected uh, with HIV through uh, these injections. Well, tell me we were, this. By I the way, we're still using uh, the same drugs uh, for the treatment of sleeping sickness. We were using the same drugs that had been uh, uh, used in the 1920s, 1930s, and uh, all of these drugs had to be given intravenously. Hmm. Uh, I don't mean to get all personal on, with you here, but you, you know that a doctor's first job is, of course, do no harm. How does one live with the knowledge that, um, you know, that you may be responsible for having harmed patients? Well, I guess that's a part of medicine, and the uh, you know eventually uh, you kind of uh, look at the um, at the whole picture, and if I look at the uh, healthcare that was uh, provided in that hospital uh, during the four years I worked there, I think overall the uh, the healthcare uh, saved the lives of uh, certainly several hundreds and perhaps more. So. Uh, you know, one has to accept that uh, there can be uh, uh, negative effects uh, of healthcare in some cases, and that's uh, that's that was unfortunate. Uh, and I think there's uh, if there's a lesson from that uh, story, which I tell in the book, which m most of it actually took place uh, much before I worked in the uh, in the Congo. Uh, is that we should be, uh, we being the medical profession and scientists in general, we should be a bit more prudent when we uh, manipulate uh, nature in a way that we do not uh, fully understand. Understood. All right, let's continue telling the story then of how AIDS started, as you believe, in Central Africa, but somehow made its way over to this hemisphere. How do you think that happened? 
What probably happened is uh, in 1960, the Congo became independent. Rapidly, there was a civil war within that country. Uh, the Belgian doctors and teachers and, uh, and nurses all uh, left uh, very suddenly. And uh, so to replace, to replace these people, the United Nations at first and eventually the Congolese government I heard uh, several thousand Haitian teachers, about four and a half thousand of them actually work in the Congo and live there for at least a few years. And uh, the most likely scenario is that one of them, and only one of them, got infected with HIV, uh, brought it back to Haiti, perhaps when this person uh, went back for a vacation in his own country, or perhaps he went there permanently. Then there was some local transmission within Haiti. And a few years later, and it took just a few years, uh, the virus was eventually re-exported uh, to the United States. And there is a fair amount of evidence which suggests that this exportation from Haiti to the US occurred through uh, sexual tourism. And all of that, all these years later, has led to more than 60 million people around the world being infected with HIV. Do you sometimes shake your head and, and wonder how this one case begat all of this misery? It's really an incredible story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, about 65 million people actually have been infected and about half of them, so 32 or 33 million so far have, have died. Uh, so it's really, I agree, it's really inc an incredible story. And it was, uh, at the beginning, it was a, a very unlikely scenario. But in the book, I try to explain the different, uh, the different factors which, uh, which allowed this uh, pandemic to develop. Now, you have uh, put forward, I gather, what much of the medical community considers to be a very contrary theory to what we've been operating with for the past 30 years. What's been, what's been the conventional wisdom about how HIV and AIDS have spread since 30 years ago? Well, the book addresses the, uh, the history of, of HIV before 1981. 1981 is the year that the disease was uh, first described. And uh, until my own book was published, there was only a single book which addressed that part of the history of HIV AIDS. Uh, that book, which, which is called The River, uh, supported a theory that uh, the origin of AIDS uh, was caused by the contamination of uh, an experimental vaccine against poliomyelitis. Uh, the author speculated that chimpanzee cells had been used for the preparation of that vaccine. And now there is uh, ample evidence and there, there is a section in the book where I review these uh, studies, which were done after the publication of that book, uh, there is ample evidence that this did, did not happen. Uh, some old vials of that experimental vaccines were actually located. They didn't contain any HIV, and they didn't contain any DNA from chimpanzees. So that theory can be rejected. So uh, now my book tries to assemble all the different parts of the puzzle from the, that first case in 1921 until the, uh, the, the disease was eventually recognized in 1981. What happened in the subsequent 30 years, uh, I don't want to give you the impression that uh, injections, uh, that medical injections played a substantial role. I think after that, most of the transmission was, was sexual, of course, heterosexual and homosexual intercourse. There was some transmission uh, among drug addicts, so the, that was transmission through injections. But I think that after 1981, for several reasons, uh, the number of cases who got uh, infected through medical injections uh, much uh, decreased. But as, you, as, as I've written in the introduction and as you've just mentioned, I think that even a single case during healthcare, now that we know about the virus, about its its modes of transmission, I think that's unacceptable and we should do everything that's possible to try to avoid this. You have certainly put a, a different theory out there and the medical world is starting to uh, consider what you've put out there. Do you think the medical world is starting to accept your theory as opposed to the one it's been operating with for the past 30 years? 
Yes, I think so far the book has been uh, well accepted. Now, uh, of course, it was published uh, uh, a few weeks ago, so uh, it certainly will take some time before the book is is um, is read and criticized by a, a number of people. Uh, I'm of course uh, willing to accept uh, criticism. Uh, you know, when you try to uh, um, to, uh, to to describe a, a history, which a story which began about 100 years ago, in very isolated areas of Central Africa. Uh, you've got to accept that uh, there is a, a margin of error on some of the uh, estimates which I've made in the book. So I'm not pretending that it is 100% accurate, but I think uh, 90% I would, I would be confident of that. I think one of the uh, areas where there is some imprecision is actually the date of that very first person infected. I told you it was most likely to be 1921, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a margin of error, so it's 19, 1921 plus or minus 10 years. So it's possible that within the few years, if additional studies are, are published, uh, maybe that, uh, that date of the very first case may change a little bit by a few years. The confidence on interval on, on that may narrow, uh, narrow down. But I don't think that would change uh, substantially the, the various uh, scenarios which I've explained in the book. Okay, let me ask you one last question, and that is, you're at the University of Sherbrooke in Quebec. You're not at the Centers for Z Disease Control. You're not at UCLA. You're not at some fancy university in France or England or Germany or whatever. And you've put out this quite astonishing new theory th that is capturing a lot of attention. Um, what's it like? Well, the, I think the, the reason I, I, was, I was able to put that, that story together was uh, uh, that I had worked in Africa for a number of years, that, that I had worked on sleeping sickness for many, many years. So I was aware of the uh, treatments which had been used in the colonial era. Then I also uh, worked on uh, HIV control projects in Africa for a long time. These were projects funded by uh, CEDA, the Canadian International Development Agency. So uh, I did a lot of work with sex workers in, in, uh, in Africa for many, many years. So I, I, I can pretend that I know a lot about prostitution. I think the fact that I, I'm a Francophone enabled me to read all these reports of the colonial era because the story took place in French and Belgian colonies. So uh, through all these uh, various uh, events in my professional life, I was able eventually to, uh, to put the story together. Understood. Dr. Jacques Pépin, we thank you very much for joining us on the line from Sherbrooke, Quebec. Merci beaucoup. It was a pleasure.